When he took over as CEO of Microsoft in 2014, Satya Nadella had big shoes to fill. Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates was leaving his role as chairman, though staying on as a special advisor. Steve Ballmer, known for his big personality, was moving on. And Microsoft's stock had languished for more than a decade. Under Nadella's leadership, however, shares have shot up nearly 100 percent as he's pushed into new territory like the cloud and made bold acquisitions, buying LinkedIn for over $26 billion. What's lesser known is how Nadella, a young engineering student, made it from India to Microsoft, joining the company in 1992 and rose through the ranks over the next three decades. Now, in his first book, Hit Refresh, he sheds light on his life and career at Microsoft and how artificial intelligence will shape the future. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella. The story of how you got from India to Microsoft in the early 90s is not your typical immigrant story. You describe yourself as a not so ambitious student. You failed an entrance exam. You said you wanted to play cricket and work at a bank. And yet here you are, the CEO of one of the biggest technology companies in the world. What is the lesson in that? I was not really planning on looking back at my life. I was mostly thinking about, hey, what's the transformation that we're going through while we're going through it? Because that was the real motivation. Uh, but with some encouragement, I went back and tried to sort of trace what are these hit refresh moments, so to speak, even in, from my past. Um, I think the thing that I now recognize more so than when I was growing up is the space I got. I think that the ability to think for yourself uh, the ability to follow your own passion versus trying to fit a particular mold in the long run has been more beneficial than any academic excellence in the short run could have. And uh, uh, that, I think, is something that I now think is perhaps uh, as important as we think about all of what we say is needed in education. The most powerful moments for me in the book are the family moments. It's really a love story for your wife and for, for your children, your son, Zane, who was born with severe cerebral palsy. How has Zane changed you as a person and as a leader? You know, when Zane was born, I was 29. Um, and if you had even asked uh, me uh, just the night he was born, a few hours before, what was sort of going through my head, I would have been more uh, when is Anu, my wife, going to get back to work as an architect? Or what's, is the nursery going to be ready? How are our weekends going to change? Uh, and yet, that night, everything changed uh, when he was born um, because of his in utero asphyxiation and he had severe brain damage, which led to cerebral palsy. But for the first couple of years, I must say, I struggled with it. In fact, everything that I thought was my plan, in some sense, fell apart. And it was all about me, and I was, well, why did this happen to me? Why did this happen to us? Uh, it was only watching my wife uh, and what she did. Uh, she immediately, just the very next day after a C-section, she stepped up and started caring for Zane. Um, and in some sense, over the years, without actually schooling me, she schooled me that nothing happened to me. Uh, something happened to Zane, and I needed to step up as my, his father. And that, to me, uh, is perhaps that most tough lesson uh, that one, uh, you know, life teaches you is to be able to see it, uh, life through others' eyes. Um, and that, to me, is perhaps where a bit of more of this need for empathy comes from. Uh, it definitely changed uh, who I was as a, uh, as a person, whether it's at home uh, or at work. In working with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer over two and a half decades, what, what are the things you want to emulate and what are the things you want to do differently? I think both Bill and Steve, one of the things that is just pretty stunning to me is their intellectual honesty. What I mean by that is their ability to see things, good and bad, uh, but most importantly, things that need to be improved uh, with such clarity. Um, and I've always felt that at Microsoft there would be lots of people who would run around uh, wanting to be like Bill and Steve, um, except that we would not have that same level of intellectual honesty. Uh, but that is just such a high standard, uh, and more importantly, such an inspiring standard they set uh, for all of us. So 
you know, it, when you came in, you you got the job and you said, look, there's a lot to fix at Microsoft. The company is sick. The company has lost its soul. How do you come in and say everything needs to be fixed without offending them? Well, I mean, in fact, when I think the courage to be able to both look at uh, what needs to be fixed and also recognize uh, what is good. Uh, that's the smarts for that, I think, is something that I, quite frankly, learned from those. In fact, Bill and his forward uh, probably captures the logic of Hit Refresh the best, which is it's not about changing everything. It's about changing what needs to be changed, and therein lies the trick, so to speak. Uh, but they were very clear. In fact, Steve's last piece of advice to me was be your own person. Uh, and I'm a consummate insider. I grew up in the company that uh, Paul and Bill founded and uh, Steve and Bill created. Um, and so to me, uh, you know, I, I, I was part of the same journey. I'm proud of that journey. Uh, yet uh, I had that outsider's perspective, as best as one can have having grown up there, uh, to be able to say, hey, look, these are things that we absolutely need to change. So when you and Bill Gates disagree, what happens? Well, look, t today Bill's very clear. Look, I'm the CEO. Uh, Bill can give me the most critical feedback, but it's up to me uh, to make sure that I'm leading the company. And uh, so there is no confusion on that. But I value, uh, quite frankly, Bill's, uh, if Bill disagrees, it's something that I probably should go look at again. We're watching you take on this uh, huge cultural shift. And, you know, we're seeing other companies like Uber, for example, struggle with making a huge cultural shift. What's your advice to someone like Dara Khosrowshahi at Uber? You know, it's always uh, hard to just, just give this general advice. The context of everyone is so different. So I think, in fact, it's for companies that have been around for a while, that in fact have had tremendous success, mm -hmm. that's when culture becomes most important. Mm -hmm. Because the culture that got you that first success may not, in fact, get you to the next. Uh, being mindful of that systems problem, so to speak, uh, I think is the job of the CEO. Uh, that's where when I think about how can a CEO be the first one to admit what needs to be refreshed uh, is super important. Uh, and that's what I'm recognizing. After all, Microsoft in 43 years has hit refresh multiple times and been able to catch a lot of big waves. We wouldn't be around competing with a whole set of new people uh, if we had not changed a lot. Uh, but also we missed a few. And so the question is, how do we recognize uh, these moments and really t capitalize on them? You've met President Trump twice now. What's your impression? You talk in the book about Microsoft needing to relearn how to be a good partner. And I'm curious, uh, one of your partnerships with Salesforce, for example, has since soured. What are the limits of partnering with competitors? I mean, I think I take anything uh, that we do, whether it's with Salesforce or with Oracle or with um, Google or with Apple or any one of them, um, and look at it and say, first, let's not think of everything as zero sum. Look at the places uh, where we can actually work together uh, to help customers uh, and compete where we have overlaps. Uh, so it's not never this very binary, uh, we're all the time competing or we're all the time cooperating. I think whether it's for any one of the com competitors uh, we you know, we'll work with, uh, we look to try and find how we can create these non-zero sum uh, cooperations. Buying LinkedIn is one of your biggest bets yet, which you bought for $26 billion. What have been the early successes and the early challenges? You know, first thing, uh, which, which was super important to us, uh, what was super important to Jeff as well, was to make sure, because most M&A uh, starts with whether the core asset mm -hmm. is it thriving. And LinkedIn is growing, uh, growing both in terms of its usage, in terms of its top line, in terms of its bottom line. So the fact that even, uh, you know, whatever, now close to six or seven months after close, we are accelerating its growth is sort of the thing that I first look to as a marker of success. What have been the early challenges of integrating such a large company into a much bigger company. We took a, a very different approach uh, to integration this time around because the goal was to have very tight alignment around mission and strategy and vision for what we want to do, but have very loosely coupled uh, integration uh, because I think that's one of the key quote-unquote patterns we wanted to follow. 
Um, Jeff leads LinkedIn. Uh, in fact, Jeff leads the LinkedIn integration uh, with Microsoft, uh, which is something that we decided day one, and I decided day one that we were going to do it differently. Uh, and it's worked out very, very well. The Microsoft Cloud is your other baby and has been for many years. Uh, Azure, though, is still very far behind Amazon AWS in terms of revenue. Where do you see it stacking up to AWS and not stacking up? Microsoft's play is not just about trying to mimic any one uh, competitor at one part of the stack. When I look at it, uh, in fact, what is at really taken off lately, even in the cloud infrastructure, is hybrid. Uh, I've always claimed, you know, multiple years that, look, the edge of the cloud is probably as exciting as the cloud is. And we'll have multiple competitors, whether it is Amazon uh, or Google, who are strong in some layers. Uh, but I would claim that we are probably the only enterprise company uh, that has strength across all the layers that are key uh, to enterprise customers. Microsoft has been very out front in opposing some of President Trump's policies, whether it's the travel ban or DACA, where you guys said, look, if you come after our people, we'll take legal action. How do you decide when to push back? For us, you know, it comes down to what are the timeless values that then have to translate into these principal stands that we take. Whether it comes to immigration, uh, making sure that we do everything to protect our employees who are contributing not only to Microsoft but to the American society, in, in the case of Dreamers, uh, taking a principal stand. So that's how we take, you know, pick these issues. Uh, but at the same time, we're not elected officials. I'm not, I don't have a mandate. Uh, so we're clear that ultimately we are subject to laws but we will fight for what we believe is the rights of our people. We've seen the NFL getting pushed back for pushing back against President Trump. Starbucks has gotten pushed back from shareholders. I'm curious, have you gotten any of that pushback from customers or the board? You know, one of the things, whether it's at the board um, or even at our management level, what, perhaps the biggest recognition, if I've learned one thing in my, whatever, three and a half years as a CEO, is the true multi constituent nature of the job, right? It's not as simple as thinking of it as just the shareholders, just the customers, just the employees, just the government. It's all of these forces simultaneously all the time. Uh, for a large company like ours, a large multinational company like ours, really balancing all of this uh, is what is required. You've met President Trump twice now. What's your impression? Uh, both the times, the conversations were all centered around. In fact, uh, my conversations were around immigration and why I think immigration uh, and immigration reform can drive American competitiveness, making the case for it, uh, as well as the need for American infrastructure, in particular digital infrastructure. Uh, and those conversations were good, and, and he was receptive to those ideas, and now we need to sort of keep working and making sure that there's action on it. We're seeing drive to further regulate the tech industry from Google to Facebook, from the U.S. to Europe. Are you concerned about the threat of increased regulation? I mean, I think the most uh, important thing for tech companies uh, is not to worry about uh, any impending regulation. You know, when a multinational, all it does is just sort of rent seek, uh, that's not long-term stable. In fact, that's not what even is long-term stable for capitalism. You have to be able to look and say, like in our case, in any country, whether it's in the UK, in Germany, in China, or in the United States, how have small businesses become more productive? Uh, how have large businesses in those countries become more competitive? How has public sector become more efficient? That, to me, is ultimately uh, how I think we have to measure our success. And that's what's going to cause governments to say, are these companies contributing or not? Do you think that the tech industry should be doing more self-policing? I mean, I think we all, uh, because the pace of change is such and rapid that we absolutely are going to look at the unintended consequences of technology and make sure that we do not trade away some of these timeless values. Mm -hmm. Uh, as there are uh, advances in technology. So I think long before even regulation, it's important for tech companies to quote unquote self-police or build the tools that create transparency, uh, make sure that people's privacy is protected. How important is it for Microsoft to keep making its own hardware? Would you ever make a phone again?
There's been a spate of sexual harassment allegations in tech, many revealed publicly, many more, I'm sure, happening that we don't know about. What is the responsibility of the tech industry here? You know, first, let's start with recognizing how important it is uh, for our business mm -hmm. to have the a diverse workforce that is then able to do their best work, uh, but that means you have an inclusive culture so that you can create the products and services that can serve the world. And I look at it in Microsoft, we talk about our mission is empowering every person in every organization. And it has to start with representing that every person in every organization inside. If you recognize that importance, then you will go to work like we are in saying, okay, where's, what's the representation? Uh, in our case, for example, women's representation, which is low. Uh, we've been pushing hard in the last couple of years. We've gone uh, and improved it by a couple of points to 27.7%, which is nothing to write home about. We have a long way to go. We improved it, in fact, by 4%, again, from a much lower base. But the thing that perhaps all of this conversation in the tech industry is, I believe, the best thing that can happen for this industry because we are now going to ha tackle front on without sort of having this be something that is not talked about mm -hmm. as what about inclusion? Mm -hmm. It's not just the numbers. The numbers don't happen uh, on their own. It only happens when people feel that they can in fact bring their A game. We have to prioritize it. We have changed even the compensation for both me and my senior leadership team uh, around diversity and inclusion. Uh, How so? and just making sure our bonuses are tied to actual improvement. So it's not just the rhetoric around it, but the numerical progress even. Um, and to be able to just put more weight behind this uh, in all dimensions. I'm not saying that's one change that's going to change it all. Uh, but to be serious about it on all dimensions. You made a, a much criticized remark at the Grace Hopper Conference in 2014 about uh, women seeking pay raises. You said it's not really about asking for a raise, but knowing and having faith that the system will give you the right raise. You apologized. You spent four pages in your book talking about why that was wrong. How has that experience informed your views about, you know, revealing your own implicit biases and, and others having the same sort of awakening? I mean, to take a question at a women's conference and answer it literally based on one's own experience, especially uh, sitting in the seat I sit in, uh, it's, just not, it's just nonsense. Because what was behind the question is, what are you as the CEO of Microsoft going to do to make the system be more fair uh, so that I get the opportunity? Uh, to do my best work. And that, to me, is of the real awakening. And that's what I went back uh, and said, wow, how could I not get that? Uh, the deeper sense behind the question. Uh, definitely for me, uh, I've used it as a learning opportunity. And for our company, I think we are better off because of my real public messing up of that, uh, because we take it seriously. But I mean, uh, I've had a chance to learn a lot from it. Speaking of the future, how important is it for Microsoft to keep making its own hardware? You know, to us, one of the key things, I guess it's Alan Kay who said, if you're serious about your software, you make your own hardware. Uh, I think there's some truth to it. And the reality is we will always invest in hardware to create new categories. So would you ever make a phone again? And under what conditions? I mean, one of the things that we have sort of said multiple times is, look, at this point, what is needed is for us to not be obsessed about categories that are well served. Mm -hmm. Uh, not at least on current rules. Uh, what is considered a phone today uh, will be a very different in the future. The question is, even take HoloLens. Is it a mobile device? Uh, yeah, it is. It's untethered. Uh, it's battery powered. You wear it on your eyes. Uh, what is the future of those kinds of devices? So to me, for Microsoft, will always be in this end-to-end -end computing experiences business. Uh, but our goal is to invent categories and reinvent categories. You uh, talk about three big strategic bets for the future in your book, mixed reality, AI, quantum computing. On the issue of AI, uh, are you at all concerned that Google or Facebook or Amazon or Apple could outpace Microsoft on AI and then become dominant in AI, this AI future that we keep hearing about? You know, to me, um, what is Microsoft's approach will be 
all around how do we take AI. Today it's a little you know, perverse in the sense that everybody says, oh, look at me, how cool I am because of the AI capability. Uh, that's not how Microsoft approaches any problem. Uh, it's not about any you know, parlor trick of ours and our prowess that we celebrate. The most important thing to us is are we democ democratizing so that every customer of ours can build their own AI? Because if we really are going to have this fourth industrial revolution, uh, we better figure out a way to democratize it so that every company, whether it's a small nonprofit uh, or a large multinational, can use AI in the context of their uh, endeavor. Uh, that's kind of what we want to do. Is Elon Musk right to be warning about the dangers of AI, whether it's the military applications or otherwise? With any new technology, uh, there is a lot of good that comes with it, and we should first grab hold of it and then be clear-eyed about any unintended consequences. So we've got to be able to use AI to first help empower humans. But that said, wherever AI you know, is, runs amok or we lose control, uh, that could be dangerous. Uh, and so I think the first responsibility we have, instead of thinking that that's going to happen, let us encode or enshrine a set of design principles. So I think that we shouldn't abdicate our responsibility. Like good user experience, there is such a thing called good AI. Uh, at least I'm of a firm belief that what is the need of the hour is for us as creators of AI to enshrine those principles. So robots could take over the world, but hopefully not. Yeah, it's up to us. What is the one product that the competition got to first that you wish Microsoft could have invented? <laughs> you know, look, if I look back, um, at history, there are many products. Uh, quite honestly, I wish we had gotten even to the relational database before Oracle. Uh, uh, because if you think about one of the most uh, amazing pieces of technology, or before IBM. Uh, so I, I just don't worry as much about looking at, hey, the product or the technology, somebody else got to it. Uh, the question is, are we able to go back to that sense of purpose that we have of what we can do with the technology, however novel and new it is, it has to be something that fits with our identity. As I said, uh, even if somebody else gets to a quantum uh, computer first, uh, what are they going to do with it versus what we're going to do it with it is going to be probably very different. You now build many of your products for several different op operating systems. So given that, what is the future importance of Windows to the Microsoft future in general? Windows, there's billion users of Windows. 300 million PCs got sold last year. Um, and it continues to be a very significant part uh, of what we do, but it's not the only part. I think that's the change for us, which is uh, we now have a much more diverse, robust business. We have Xbox and gaming, uh, which, by the way, spans both PC gaming and the console gaming. We have more than 55 million Xbox Live subscribers. We have the Windows business, which is not just about the device. In fact, some of the fastest growing pieces of Windows are all about Microsoft 365, like the security and management services. We obviously have our uh, Office 365 services that are part of it. We have LinkedIn. We have Dynamics 365. We have Azure and our hybrid infrastructure. So Microsoft, in that sense, is a much more diversified uh, portfolio with linkages between them. Uh, that's, I think, how we're going to keep going forward. All right. Sachin Adela, thank you so much for joining us today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0. So great to have you. Thank you so much, Emily.